hi, Marc Antoine. Hello, good to see you again. How are you? Yeah, thank you. I'm very good. How about you? Yeah, not bad at all. Not bad. How are things uh, the others across the pond? Today you're in Canada, unlike last time you're in Copenhagen. Still too cold for a. Uh, we're we're kind of late in, in what March now, and it's still super cold. A lot of snow. Should, should should have stayed in Europe. We've had probably the best March we've had in years, absolutely yeah. years. I was in Copenhagen early March. Copenhagen in London. I, I've made. I went back to Europe, filled a nice sweater, then I get back here to the cold again. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, look, fair enough. Well, at least, at least, at least, at least, you know, you're, you're, you're back home. Good to have you here again. Um, last time, uh, obviously, we discussed about, we talked about who Capdesk is, what you guys do, went into your products. Today, slightly a bit different. We just want to focus on um, an interesting point. Um, I thought it was worth sharing with the community um, when you and I discussed it, which is the migration process. You end up ended up going through a migration process, and there was a lot we discussed. And I thought it would be very, very interesting to share with the community of engineers that we have. So, shall we get down to it? Do you want to tell us straight away? Let's go hit the migration project. What was the migration project? What was that? Yeah. Oh well, I, I was hired for this project basically. So uh, we were on Angular one point. I don't know six seven. So very old legacy version within the end of very life. Very yeah, the, like the support was getting dropped uh, well last December so now we're on an unsupported version of Angular uh, well we're migrating out of it and yeah I, I was brought in the team to find the, the way forward what's next how do we keep the app alive how do we improve it how do we make developer experience better and, and so on so uh, a lot of research a lot of uh, proof of concept to, to find what was right for us and yeah, I, I got started with that a, a year ago now. It's uh, my first year at Capdesk. It was the uh, 1st of March, so a year later. Oh, wow. okay. So what, what, one year later. So you came in then with the idea to go through this migration. Yes. Okay. Um, what, just out of curiosity, why Angular 1.67? I mean, why, why such a old legacy version? I, I think for a while when... They were a startup when they, they built it. Uh, they started that five, six years ago, maybe uh, by the founders. They created this Rails app and they just use uh, a tool called Webpacker. And everything was in this one big model, both Angular and Rails. It just made sense back then. But they never ever had a chance to migrate out of it or to, uh, to uh, upgrade it. So they just stick with it, trying to get... Uh, uh, a market fit, and now that we have the market fit, now we have we have time to uh, fix on migrating out of it. So you came in with wanting to bring the solution. Do you wanna do you wanna talk us through that journey of coming across that arriving at the solution, saying okay we are here, how do we migrate? Talk talk us through it. Yeah, it was a very, I think. Okay, I, I was brought in as an expert. I was the, the first full-time front-end engineer. My, my other colleagues were back-end engineer, full-stack people. Uh, some had more front-end experience than others, but I, I was brought in as the expert. And we, I was tasked with finding a solution. But we also wanted it to be an inclusive process. You don't want everybody to feel left out, to be bumped by the decision. Uh, so... My, my first step was just to research what, what can we do, right? What are the solutions? What do I think is good for us? And uh, check, check that out with the team. What do they think about it? What, uh, wh which solution do they like? Do they want to keep with uh, Angular? Do they want to do something else? So it was a very inclusive research process. We did what we call an RFC. It's taken from Rust, Request for Comments. I basically wrote this big document, well, not so big, but, you know, an ocean page and uh, asked for comments. I asked people, hey, what do you think about this solution? What do you think about this proof of concept? And we basically compared uh, Vue, Svelte, and React. And we also needed to know how are we going to phase out Angular? How do we make React and Angular live side by side? Uh, mostly because with a big app, you cannot just work on 
one year on a big project without releasing it, right? You need to put it out at some point. So I guess course. those were the first step uh, in the process before building anything, really. So we're not going to... The last thing we want to do, really, um, is go into the discussion of why, you know, React over Angular or anything like that. But, you know, you did use Angular before, so why not stick to Angular? Why not simply... why? completely change why as i said you mentioned you looked at svelte and view as well so why choose uh react yeah uh as you might know or maybe people in the audience will know the difference between angular js the old angular and the new one is quite massive so migrating from one to the other was probably as expensive in dev time and in learning than switching to react or svelte would be so it was basically a clean slate. We, we, we had a chance to just, do we want to stick with Angular? I, I honestly, I didn't even check Angular because we were just, uh, we had our site on React. That's the, that was the, the, the solution we were always thinking uh, about. And that's that's why that's why we, we picked it in the end. Okay. And it's, you know, it's a very inclusive process. I like. I, I really like the sound of that. I'm sure the audience will absolutely love that. Uh, the fact that you went to the existing team and said, okay, what do you guys think of this? Tell me your thoughts. You're trying to find the best way forward. What were some of the challenges you had um, in deciding on, you know, not necessarily React, but in the solution? What were some of the ch those challenges? Um, I think the two big ones, one, the first one was the strategy. How, how, how will Angular and React live side by side? How do we assure consistency, quality, uh, no downtime, and an experience that doesn't look like two different websites for the end user? So that's that's the first art thing. And the other one, I think, is funny enough. At some point, I created a big, uh, well, a ten question type form, and I asked people. Uh, what do you like about this and that? And one question was, uh, do you like to write CSS? Do you like to write style? What would you like the new application to look like in terms of styling? And one of my bullet the, the suggestion of answer was, I don't ever want to write CSS again. And a, a loud majority clicked that. So in the end, we went for a solution that limited the amount of CSS and style actual full stack and backend engineer had to write. Okay, so uh, I want to I want to I want to go back to that. I will definitely go back to that. But starting with the first challenge you had, um, yeah, it, it is. It, it's not exactly an off-the-shelf solution, is it? Getting React and Angular to work side by side. This is something you had to create for you guys. Yeah, there's there's many way to do that. Uh, Micro Frontend is one of them with uh, what they call single SPA. That's a cool solution wasn't very uh, working for us. You can also try to have both Angular and React component work side by side in the same page. Uh, we, we can dig in that if you're interested, but we didn't choose that because you basically have the worst of both worlds. You have none of the advantage of a, a pure solution, but you have all the inconvenience of having two very different framework living side by side. And what we decided to do is to migrate with uh, it's known as the strangler pattern, but basically a piece at a time. It's like if you, you do house renovation, you, you you work your home. Well, you're not going to change the whole house at once. You're going to do one room at a time. So that's basically what we're doing. We're migrating a page. We have some tool that reroute the user to either Angular or, or React. And, and, and that's it. That just works simply like that. It's quite magical. I, I don't think anybody... Uh, that is non-technical could notice that there is two different apps living uh, under the CapDesk website. Is that going? Is that going to be so? How long are you going to maintain this solution, the React and Angular side by side? As long as we need. I think the end goal is to migrate out of Angular entirely, and on that day we'll be able to get rid of the proxy app that we that use uh, we use for routing, but. We also need to ship value, and some pages don't bring a lot of value. Uh, it, it's not important to migrate, let's say, uh, FAQ page, right? It's it's it brings almost no value at all. So we're focusing on high value pages, uh, the biggest 
selling point of the app the most complexity or the one that brings us the most trouble because when we're uh, migrating them, we get a chance to rework them. So I, I think it will take at least, at the very least, one more year, but it could be more than that. And I think it will take maybe one, two years before we can completely get rid of Angular. Uh, yeah. Oh, but I mean, as, as, as you said, you're, you're, you want to get there, but it will take as long as you need it to. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's a, it's it is. I can't help but ask how. I mean, being in a tech community, um, we're not. A, I mean, we, we would never try to generalize, but there is a theme that you know. Um, some developers who are comfortable doing what they're doing, they don't necessarily want to get out of that comfort zone. So how? I mean, how did you manage to convince? Um, the team to say, okay, we're not, we're going to go completely from Angular. I obviously love the inclusive aspect of that you asked them, but you're basically training your people on that. Or did you actually hire other people other than yourself to just simply come in and do the job? Uh, a mix of both. I think the first idea was to not hire that many front end engineers, but at some point we had to. Uh, we hired two other because. I mean, uh, it's a huge product and the migration effort was taking quite some time. But we also had a lot of full stack engineers that were used to Angular. And yes, they needed to be trained. They needed to be helped, mentored in that process. And yeah, as you said, we didn't get any pushback. I think the team was always on board with the project. They knew we had to move out of it. And uh, we really cared about developer experience. We, we cared about their point of view and that was that was big I think in them feeling that they were listened to and they, they trust me they trust me and the other people working on that project to just do the right thing and I think the feedback let's say first page was released June I think but during the summer the feedback was very good people were starting to get into uh, the, the code to have to do small fixes or features and so on and People were just, yeah, this is this is well built. Like I, I want to work in that because it was such a good improvement in terms of developer experience, and it was not overwhelming. Well, sometimes it is, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, I, I think I gave a lot of support, mentorship, code reviews, trying to help people get into it. And I think it's a, it's all about the mentality. If you go into it and you want people to be. Uh, happy about it, there's a way to do it. There's a way to just say, hey, we're going to do it this way. We'll help you. Uh, This is better. And once people are convinced that this is better, that this is a way forward. It's it's just easy, I think. So do you want to tell us a bit more about that way? Because, I mean, you say there is a way to getting people on board, but we all think sometimes we do have a way. But what was the key? How did you guys managed to win the favor of the full stack team how did you go on about getting them to train on react what what, what were the methods you used? did you just you know get them to go so through some courses did you do some exit what how was that process whole process yeah um well i, I think we we're lucky we had very strong engineers who just understood the basics of uh front end so that that was somewhat easy some of them had touched React a couple of years earlier uh, during the class component era. Uh, so they, they knew a, a tiny bit about it. So that helped definitely. Uh, the one that didn't have any experience with it, I've curated a list of resources that they could uh, take some time to, to, to read, to listen to during their work. And uh, we, we usually started them on very simple tasks. So the, this big project also features a component library on Storybook. And basically would say, hey, there's this new component, very small thing that we need. Uh, there's a lot of example here. You can l- look at this one and almost duplicate it. Uh, and then we would let them go, ask question, and give them a good code review. I think that's the easiest way to get started. Simple task, help them uh, get into it. And, and then something I'd like to mention that I think was really important is that from the beginning, this project was taught with great, great developer experience in mind. I 
you know, when you play bowling, there's sometimes for the children, those little fences that prevent you from throwing the ball in the, I don't know this word in English, sorry, but to make the, this, the sides, yeah, to help yeah, you stay. Exactly. And my job was basically to build that fence, to build that fence and say, hey, just throw the ball. You cannot make big mistakes with what I've built. Good typing, uh, good presets, good default values, a good uh, component library. And with that, it's hard for them to actually get trapped because we have so many example, good documentation, good unit tests. It's very hard for someone to to get, not to get lost, but it's hard to make big mistakes or to go in a very wrong direction. I, I was just a, a pathfinder. I created the path for them and now everybody can use that whole path I created uh, again and again. It works. Like one of our engineer, Alex, he just keeps surprising me. Like he had no React experience at all. And he's very good. Every time he makes a PR, I'm like, Wow, man, that's that's crazy good. Not that I didn't expect that, but I'm just happy that it's that easy for them. Like we've been able to create something um, that's um, simple enough to be understood, even if you have uh, a, a smaller front end background. I think. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask. I want to ask because now here we are in this community. We are big, big advocates of training your staff, obviously develop experience, employee experience. Um, would you say, focusing on that, was it perhaps more time consuming? Was it more uh, costly for the company to train the staff, to put in that effort in, instead of, for example, bringing an entire new team and, you know, because in many cases, we've seen companies, we've been involved with so many different companies previously who, in a similar in a similar project, what they would do is would just bring a new team and then perhaps the older team might feel a bit uncomfortable and then end up leaving slowly. From, from, from your point of view, this is, is this just idealistic what you guys did just because you want to be an idealist or is it actually better? Hmm... We have, we have a very strong team of engineer and we also have a, a domain that is very complex. I think FinTech and equity management is, is very hard. So it was both because, so there, there was a, a heavy cost up front. Like when we start onboarding somebody, I, I, I can definitely lose 50% of my productivity that first week or maybe not 50, but I think you get the point. Uh, but I think of the long, longer term or on three months, six months, we gain a tremendous uh, efficiency because this person that knows the app very well also knows the business logic very, very well. So if we were to onboard a new front-end engineer, it would take him maybe six months, maybe a year to be even close to that back-end or full-stack engineer in terms of comprehension of the platform. So that... I think that was uh, one of the reasons. And I, I think it's uh, very efficient because talent is not always there when hiring. It's not always easy to find the right one. And when you have good engineer, you want to invest in them. You want to develop them. So yeah, in a sense, it's ideological, but I, I think it works. It works to invest in your engineer. You keep them happy, you grow their skills, and then they're just better at their job. To go on that point then, hiring. When you guys are hiring, then what do you look for? You mentioned there's not you can't always just look for pure talent. What what are you looking for when you hire for any of your vacancies on the tech side? Yeah, uh, I think we're flexible. Like obviously with like a React senior senior React engineer and a senior Rails engineer that have a lot of experience in fintechs and blah blah blah. You know. That a unicorn person. We all, love, <laughs> we all want that unicorn. Exactly, exactly. So um, I think now we're very flexible. If you have relevant backend experience, uh, if you have good communication skills, that's important in a remote setting, uh, then you basically get to, to the test right away almost. Like Melissa will do a screening and then you get to a point where we submit you this challenge. That is language uh, agnostic. We don't ask for any specific language in the challenge, and there's very little in terms of coding required 
for that challenge. What we want is people think uh, we have a thought process that is pragmatic. We want people who will understand problems, understand challenges, and can solve them, but also can communicate those solutions. If you have that, you check a lot of the boxes, and um, we've hired people who had very little Rails backend or React backend, and they perform very well because they had the right tools. So if, if you have the right profile, we're happy to invest in you and make you, uh, make you our perfect engineer. <laughs> so you, you, as long as they have what you're looking for, like you said, the, the, the problem solving, um, the, the communication skills, being able to think outside the box, um, you are more than happy to get them up to speed to your tech stack, to provide them the tools. Like you said, and to, to, to use your own expression, the bowling example, you have those defenses on the sides so that they can come in and, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. We want you for you. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things that we are interested in. Uh, any cloud-based experience is very good. If you work in a, in a startup, in, in a, any kind of web business, it's, it's much better, right? There's certain profile we're interested in. And uh, th those people usually perform very well with us. So that's, that's why we, we're looking for those. But then, yeah, if you, if you have the good basics, if you have a strong engineering background, uh, or e even if you're somebody who changed lane or changed career, we're happy to, to give you a chance and to, to prove yourself in our test. And I, I, that might be out of topic a bit, but I think our test is our review process, our interview process is very good. We have a lot of very good feedback. Even if we refuse, recheck somebody, they, they often come back to us and say, hey, that was a very good process. I enjoyed it. And we, we even, uh, if you get to the technical test, we will always give you uh, a loom, a video, a short video of feedback telling you why we didn't pick you and also what you could improve, what you should work on. So. We're, we're really invested in that in that approach of learning and teaching and uh, just fostering growth. I absolutely I absolutely love that. I mean, hats off to you guys for 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 doing that. Um, a lot of companies don't really inve in, in invest into their hiring process, into their uh, recruitment process, especially on the feedback. I mean, we've been singing about that, being very vocal for many years. Um, my question to you is, um, just on that particular one, and hopefully, uh, also, you know, people who don't necessarily implement this system can hear this. Why do you put so much effort into the interview process? Well, there's... To I, make I it there's... a friendly process, giving that feedback, this Loom mm -hmm. video. Not many people do that. Most companies don't even do that. In fact, you know, many don't even bother with their feedback. Just, you know... Unfortunately, you won't be selected. Yeah, I think I can list a few, but uh, because it's, it's the humane thing to do, it's the right thing to do to give feedback. People invest time in your interview process, and it's just right to give back a bit of your of our own time, even if it's time consuming. It's it is it's super time consuming to give good feedback to all the candidates, but we still do it. Uh, second thing is employee branding. Whether you want it or not, you get the reputation, even for people you don't hire. And we want them to stay, uh, to keep their interest in the company. They were in the process with us. They wanted to join us and we will grow. We'll raise more money. We'll need more engineers. And we want those people to get back at us a year later and say, Hey, I fixed those issues. I'd like to get another shot. Can you pass me an interview again? And we'll gladly do so. So I, I think it's a win-win. It, it's, it's a long-term investment. It's a branding investment, but I think. Uh, we're getting people excited about CapDesk and that's that's the goal. Even if you're rejected, maybe you say, hey, they, they will go and say to their friends, their colleagues, hey, this business is very cool. I was rejected, but you should look it up. And that's what we want. It is so refreshing to hear that from an employer, coming from an employer um, point of view. Before we end this, Marc-Antoine, it's always great chatting to you, but before we end it, what live vacancies do you currently have? People listening here, obviously they can go to your website, but do you want to tell us any particular things, any specific vacancies you're looking for or looking to fill? 
Uh, yeah, I think we have a couple of roles open. We have a, a back-end engineer role. We have full-stack role, front-end role. We also, I think, are still looking for a lead engineering position. If you want to join one of our squad and, and lead that squad, uh, that's, that's what we're looking for. So basically everything but mobile, maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I think we're still looking for a slightly more senior profile. So like, uh, but but we're thinking and probably will open more junior position uh, at the end of the summer when we'll have a bit more breathing room. What's regarding the um, remote working flexibility about that? I mean, obviously you're based in Canada. You came to London before. You were also in Copenhagen. But is that are you restricted perhaps to specific cities or countries? No, not at all. I, I, I won't dive into the, the exact uh, rules we have in place, but basically we're team first, you work where you want. Uh, we have a, a, a company we work with that allows us to hire people in in every, in every country or almost. We have a list that is easier for us because we already have tooling for them. So I think we're about 10, maybe 15 countries right now in CapDesk. And we're not wow. that big. We're, we're 50, 60 something people. So uh, we are everywhere. It's very helpful for engineers. <laughs> not going to lie. It's much easier to be able to have this big crowd. Uh, and then, yeah, we're very, we're very uh, remote friendly. We have a remote uh, stipend. You can also visit their quarter uh, with with money, like we give you money to visit the quarter, we have on-site events. Uh, well, it's it's very much slowed by the pandemic, but uh, yeah, we, we invest a lot in that remote experience. And yeah, last last time I was in Copenhagen early in the month, it was uh, for a product event. So we met all the, the product managers, product designers, and engineers. We got there, spent a couple of days together, just uh, like creating a culture, right? How big is your current, currently, how big is your engineering team? Uh, good question. I think we're 10, maybe 12. We have three squad of a uh, couple of uh, engineers with a PM, a product designer. Um, but we're still growing. Not as quickly as we'd like, but we're still growing. Honestly, listening to all this is now kind of making me wish I didn't stop coding, <laughs> and I'm still <laughs> and I'm still still developing because it's it's very very tempting. Um, Marc Antoine, this is it's always been a pleasure, o always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us today, and uh, yeah, well, let's leave it to the audience. I'm sure they'll be in touch uh, because this 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 just sound too good to waste of an opportunity. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.